Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presented by SAMHSA's Gain Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Today's webinar is titled Reaching In, Planning for a Successful Transition Back into the Community. We have three presenters uh, today, that, and I will be introducing them shortly. They are Dr. Andrea Dauber Griffin, Mr. Jacob Brevard, and Ms. Stephanie Lau. I am Erica Ihara. I am a project associate at Policy Research Associates and SAMHSA's Gain Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation. And before we start the presentations, I have some housekeeping items to review. First, our disclaimer, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. If you have any questions for the presenters uh, or in regards to the technology, uh, please use the Q&A pod, which is on the right of your screen. We will address as many of your questions to the presenters as time permits. We will also be conducting a couple of polls, and we appreciate your participation in these. If you'd like to participate, uh, when you see a poll pop up on your screen, please go ahead and enter your responses, and we do appreciate it. This webinar is being recorded and slides will be disseminated via the GAINS listserv following the webinar. We will also notify you when the webinar recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel and a certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of the webinar. And just as a reminder, this certificate is for personal portfolio use only. It is not for CEU credits. We have ASL interpretation for today, and in order to view our interpreters, if you haven't already done so, uh, go to layout in the upper right corner of your screen and select uh, hide non video participants and then change the layout view to full screen. Finally, select view all. We have 2 uh, interpreters today and we have uh, we have Kip Opperman. Uh, who's who's our uh, substitute today? Uh, apologize that we don't have his name up on the screen, and we have Michelle Johnson. We also have live captioning for today, and in order to view the live captioning, select the accept button, which is in the lower right corner of your screen. It's in the multimedia pod, and the color contrast of the live caption pod can be changed as needed. And we recommend high contrast style for best visibility. And next, I would like to introduce today's agenda. In a moment, John Berg will give some comments from SAMHSA, and then the presentations will follow. And we have some time reserved at the end to address questions from the audience. So now I would like to turn this over to John Berg, who is Senior Public Health Advisor at the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA for some opening remarks. And uh, I've just been informed that we're having some technical issues and John may not be available. John, are you there? Okay, so we are going to unfortunately uh, move to the next section. So I would like to um, begin introducing our speakers. So, Dr. Andrea Dauber Griffin is the senior program director of Project Inreach at the Neighborhood House Association, which is located in San Diego, California. She is a lecturer, researcher, and a writer with expertise in behavioral health and criminal justice. And she leads the policy and procedure committee of the San Diego County Reentry Roundtable. And this is a group uh, of multiple stakeholders which works to address obstacles to reentry at the national, state, and county levels. Mr. Jacob Brevard is the Associate Director of Inside Programs for the Anti Recidivism Coalition, which is also known as ARC in Los Angeles, California. His work is informed by his own lived experience of previous incarceration. And he manages ARC's Hope and Redemption team, which is staffed by individuals who all previously had life sentences. And his team provides a variety of in-reach programming inside 
California State Prisons, and he will be presenting about that work today. Ms. Stephanie Lau is Executive Director for Catholic Charities Care Coordination Services, which is located in Albany, New York. She is a social worker who, in her decades of work, has done direct services, program development, implementation, and monitoring. And she has led her agency's transition to health homes, expansion of their harm reduction programming, and leads Project SafePoint, which provides uh, of an array of harm reduction services in the community. And I'd like to share some observations about who's in our audience today. So thank you to everyone who uh, participated in the poll. It looks like the majority of you are calling in from urban areas, followed by rural areas in the next largest category, and then suburban areas in the smallest category today. We have people calling in from corrections, probation and parole, crisis services providers, um, the judiciary, law enforcement, community-based organizations, government, people in public health, and a couple of you who uh, checked the, the other box. So thank you all for uh, letting us know where you are, and um, we appreciate your, your taking time out of your afternoon or mornings uh, to, to join today's conversation. So I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Dauber Griffin to begin the presentations. Thank you very much, Erica. I hope everybody can hear me okay. If not, please do let me know and I will call in. So um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. And thank you for joining us today for this presentation. Um, I represent here today the Neighborhood House Association, which is one of the most um, active and longstanding associations and organizations in San Diego County. We are a multi-purpose human service provider um, and our history stretches all the way back to 1914. So we've been around for a very long time. Our mission is to enrich lives through a continuum of education and wellness services. And our vision is to create healthy and educated communities where dreams become reality. And we strive to accomplish our mission, mission and achieve our vision through currently 25 key programs that are offered at 125 locations throughout San Diego County. And when I say that we are a multi-purpose human service provider, what I mean is that we serve a wide variety of populations um, all the way from uh, little infants through our early Head Start and Head Start programs um, all the way to adults, uh, to seniors, and we provide a, a broad array of services to our uh, residents in San Diego County. I am here today to talk about our Project InReach programs. Uh, there are currently two. One um, is sort of the program we started with. It is the Project InReach program. And in 2019, we added a program which we named Project InReach Ministry. And they are in-reach programs. We provide in-reach to almost all of San Diego County jails. Uh, there are seven jails, if I counted correctly, and we currently access five of them. Or, yeah, five of them. Um, our goals in these programs is to obviously decrease relapse and reduce recidivism upon uh, return to the community. And we focus on ensuring a successful linkage between exiting jail and accessing community-based services. That typically includes anything having to do with mental health, uh, substance use treatment, co-occurring treatment, uh, but also any um, neglected healthcare issues that many individuals have had for a number of years, along with um, social services, supportive services, um, that aim at strengthening uh, the person's um, success in the community. We work to reduce the stigma that is attached to mental health and substance use treatment by providing education. Uh, we work a lot with peer supports, and our hope is that through engaging peers, uh, we are able to establish um, a better connection to our program participants 
and helping them understand how the services available can really help them in their transition from jail to the community. And I will be talking a little more about peers a little later on. And lastly, we try to also address criminogenic risks and needs. Um, obviously, substance use um, is a very strong criminogenic risk. I think we all know that, um, but also, uh, for example, uh, going back to surrounding oneself with antisocial peers, um, gang related affiliations, uh, things of that nature, antisocial cognition, antisocial thinking, essentially, and behaviors. Um, those are uh, all things we also try to uh, incorporate into our service delivery. We serve a um, population that could be sentenced or unsentenced. I have listed here the names of the jails that we currently serve. Um, we work with the whole county and the individuals we like to focus on initially were uh, those with a mild to moderate substance use or mental health needs. And over the years, we have, um, over the years, we have expanded um, to also include services for those living with serious mental illness. Um, our program participants may be on high or medium risk uh, probation supervision. They may also be on parole or they may be on both. And within the San Diego County Jail system, uh, we work with individuals who are on uh, custody levels 1 to 5. The only custody level uh, that we do not serve is 6. And the inreach component, because somebody asked uh, the question, uh, the inreach component of our program, I will elaborate on in just a little bit. And um, here you can see the specific services we provide. Uh, so the project enrich program, which, by the way, started in 2012. Uh, so we are actually coming up on our 10 year anniversary with this program. It has been very successful in San Diego County. Uh, we provide, um, of course, in reach. Um, we connect with clients once uh, they are in jail. Uh, they get referred to us. Uh, I will go over the process here in just a minute. Uh, we meet with them, we provide screening and uh, mental health and substance use assessments to see where the person's needs are. Uh, if the person agrees to come into the program, it's a voluntary program. They receive clinical case management, uh, peer support services, transitional housing, transportation assistance. The county is a very large county. Um, you know, to go from south to north can take anywhere, depending if you have to take public transportation, it could take you half a day. Uh, so, transportation assistance is very important um, and we also provide warm handoff services uh, to treatment and supportive services, as I said, as well as support and educational groups. In 2019, we added a, um, another program, which we named Project in Reach Ministry, where we specifically focus on also um, adding faith-based services. So uh, the way this works is we send a clinician together with a pastor to meet with a prospective program participant while they are in jail. And this person then gets to meet both the clinician and the pastor. Uh, we contract with several churches in San Diego that um, help us offer the service. And then the program participant gets to choose who they want to work with. They can choose, eat, they can choose to work with the clinician, uh, they can choose to work with the pastor, or they can choose to work with both if that is what they want. And much to our surprise, um, the vast majority, if not, you know, probably 99.9% .9 of all people who are offered the service choose to work with both. Um, and that is much to our surprise. And of course, we, we greatly welcome this um, development. Our pastors offer pastoral counseling, spiritual guidance. And of course, uh, there is a stronger focus on providing warm hand of services to a whole variety of faith based um, programs and services and faith communities in San Diego County. Um, since the question has come up, I would like to. I'll briefly show you this process, this in reach process. So we have uh, two phases essentially the pre release and the post release phase. Um, 
the process starts by us receiving referrals, mostly from the sheriff's department, who we have a very close uh, partnership with. Um, but they could also come from the probation department. We occasionally receive referrals from community members, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and then all we have to do is connect with the sheriff's department to ensure that uh, these referrals can be approved to our program because it is a close referral program. Usually we get those referrals. Um, it could be literally anywhere between 10 to 180 days prior to release. Um, depending on where in the court process a person is, uh, you may remember that I said we work with both sentenced and unsentenced individuals. Sentenced individuals, it, the process is a bit easier because they have a set release date and unless um, early releases are conducted, the case management and, and referral process is a lot smoother. For those who are unsentenced, we have to really work very closely with all parties involved. That's the district attorney, uh, that is the public defender, that's the courts, that's the sheriff's department, because we simply don't know what will happen at the person's next court hearing. They could get time served, uh, they could be sentenced to prison, all kinds of things could happen. So we need to uh, prepare for that uh, with a lot more detail. Um, and we sometimes get a referral for a person who literally gets released four days later. So those are a bit more challenging to manage. Um, but yeah, we also get referrals for individuals who are nine months from release. So that could happen too. And then typically um, I screen uh, the participants who come uh, to us uh, from the named agencies, and then I assign them to a clinical uh, team member who then uh, sends an email uh, to the individual in custody, introduces themselves because we don't want to surprise people when we show up. We want them to accept our visit when we come to the facility to meet with them. So we typically send them communication ahead of time to make them aware that somebody will be coming from the program to introduce the services and offer the services. And that usually works very well. So by the time uh, the clinician or the substance use counselor meets the individual in custody, they've already received the email, they know who's in front of them. Um, and then uh, the person usually agrees to complete a screening. And if they would like to receive the services, they complete an intake. And from that moment forward, um, of course, the paperwork uh, needs to be completed. The treatment plan or the post-release plan needs to be established. We do that with the input from the participant because we know and realize that uh, whatever we feel a person needs to do upon release may not be what the person feels they need to do upon release. And so it's very important to develop comprehensive goals and that are attainable. Um, help the individual understand what barriers may be in place to attain and, and achieve those goals. Um, and of course, to help them stay focused on their specific uh, treatment, treatment goals. Um, because again, the individuals that come to us live with serious mental illness, co-occurring disorders. Um, I'm sure many of you know that co-occurring diagnoses are um, quite, um, widespread and frequent, and so that is definitely something we need to also incorporate into the transitional plan, along with housing, transportation, healthcare, documentation is something that we uh, run into quite a bit. So making sure the person has a, um, has a California ID, um, can access mental health care through having health insurance, that is also not often the case. Um, and so there's all kinds of steps that we need to focus on to make sure it's a safe and successful transition into the community. Um, as time goes on, the person's release is coming up. We um, collaborate strongly with the Sheriff's Department through their coordinated release program. It is called, uh, we essentially notify the facility that there is a person getting released from custody within the next 24 hours and that our staff will be there to pick them up. The facility staff will then coordinate any sort of um, prescription medicine uh, that perhaps needs to be issued. The Sheriff's Department typically issues 10 days worth. 
that gets sent to a pharmacy where on the day of release, we take the uh, program participant to the pharmacy so they can pick up their medicine. Um, and from there, they go to their uh, destination. And then we are in the post release phase where our staff, our team provides 90 plus days post release case management wraparound services. We pick up almost all of our clients from jail uh, because we know that they typically don't have transportation available um, and sometimes transportation plans from family or friends fall through. Uh, they typically don't have a safe place to go. And so most of the time we pick our um, program participants up from jail and take them to the agreed upon uh, destination, which could be a sober living residence, which could be a residential substance use program, which could be an ACT program. Of course, all of those linkages and the uh, referrals that need to be placed, we try to take care of that uh, while the person is still in custody so that we don't lose time upon release um, with these referrals and it takes time to place clients in programs or for programs to accept clients. So uh, we try to make sure we take care of all of that while the person is still in custody. And then at the end of the 90 days, hopefully uh, we are a linkage program. So hopefully we have linked the participant to all needed services and sure they are engaged. Um, and at that point they would be released from or discharged, I should say, from our program. We have about 60% of our staff are peers. Um, again, we find peers to be extremely invaluable to the services we provide. They bring lift experience to the care team. Um, I, you know, we have clinicians, pre-licensed and licensed clinicians on the team, substance use counselors, social workers, and we also have peers and they typically bring um, a very different perspective to our uh, care coordinating meetings, to our client conversations, and it's much appreciated. They um, tend to approach our program participants in a much different manner compared to our clinical staff or our substance use staff. And they can really tackle some of these very personal challenges with them in a much more productive way than our clinical or our substance use staff could. They can serve as a critical sounding board uh, for the client's reasoning um, and also the decisions they anticipate to make. Uh, there's plenty of times where a client wants to leave a program, for example, a substance use program, or they want to drop out of ACT services. Um, and then the peers can have those really hard, you know, sometimes difficult heart to heart conversations with them about what is really going on. And we find that provides extremely um, helpful added value uh, for our clients. And then perhaps also uh, importantly, they can help the clinical team understand um, aspects of uh, the client's perspective that the clinical team may not necessarily understand simply because they don't have that lift experience. They have the training, they have uh, the expertise from their um, professional backgrounds, but they may not have that um, lift experience. And then I was researching sort of what, if, what is the evidence? We talk a lot about evidence-based practice and corrections and programming. And so I was you know, sort of reviewing the research literature and um, there isn't sort of a substantial body of research that looks at the role of peer supports and their efficacy. Um, but the research that I wanted to highlight is, uh, for example, this research right here, which found that pre-release, pre-release peer programs are effective for both men and women um, populations in jails as well as in prisons and for those excuse me, living with serious mental illness and co-occurring disorders. So peers can uh, bring their expertise to a whole variety of populations in prison or jail. They are not somehow um, restricted in the type of service or the type of population that they can serve. Another research here found that, um, and this is more, more speaking to how peers are integrated into teams, um, their role in the work environment was often undervalued um, or their job title did not match the duties of their position. Um, and the, this research also found that clients should be assigned to peers based upon their strengths and lift experience instead of the more formal categories such as gender or uh, language. 
and uh, specifically peers with criminal justice history, um, they tend to approach working with justice and law of clients differently compared to clinicians, for example, uh, with specific regard to the disclosure, their own disclosure of substance use history, experience, strength and hope, um, how they develop relationships with justice involved clients and their efficacy with instilling hope in clients with justice involved um, background, uh, which can be um, very valuable when it comes from the peer as opposed to a clinician, for example. In our work um, with these individuals who live with serious mental illness and co-occurring disorders in um, our county jails, um, we run into a wide variety of challenges, individual level challenges, but also system level challenges. And as an agency, we obviously have to try and navigate both. We may be more successfully doing so with individual level challenges than with system level challenges. Um, but some of the things we frequently um, run into are, of course, you know, this creating an understanding and helping program participants understand the sort of the um, necessity and the value that treatment can bring uh, for them in the long run. Often we find that our clients are more focused on the short term rather than the mid or long term. And so um, helping somebody understand or motivating them to accept treatment is um, very difficult, especially if you only have 10 days or two weeks with this person before they get released into the community. Uh, we often find that reconnecting them with family and friends can be particularly difficult because our population um, is often very disengaged, not just from societal institutions, but also from their friends and family. Many times family members don't want uh, to really stay in touch still uh, with that individual. And so we try to um, work with both parties to kind of create an understanding of the, the challenges and the difficulties that present to see if there is a willingness to re-engage. Um, our clients sometimes circle in and out of jail 10 plus, 20 plus times a year. So the, sometimes they spend more time in custody uh, than they spent out in the community. And so how do you work with somebody in such a short amount of time that we at least have? How do you work with somebody to help them develop a sense of quality of life or a sense of purpose uh, when they are so used to continuously circling in and out of jail. Uh, that is something that is goes beyond case management, um, obviously, but we can't do successful case management if we cannot engage our population successfully, uh, if we cannot get them to um, speak to us, if we can't get them to return our phone calls, then uh, the best case management in the world isn't going to make a difference. And then, of course, the more mundane sort of challenges, such as obtaining documentation, um, be it the birth certificate or the ID that many people don't have when they come out of custody, be it prison or jail, um, tends to be an obstacle um, as well. On the system uh, level, we often find that obtaining clearance for peers can be a challenge. And uh, we think the only real effective way to address this is to have consistent and continuous conversations with the powers that be to sort of arrive at a shared understanding of what really the value of peers is, what the legitimate, the legitimate concerns and reasons may be that peers do not receive Sheriff's Department clearance and how we can work together um, to address this obstacle. And we are currently in this process. Um, we actually were just awarded funding for a peer reentry leadership academy that we will be conducting in San Diego County. Um, and there is a shared vision. It's just about how do we create the steps to um, get to actually enact the vision and the peer reentry leadership academy is going to be a part of that. Uh, we want to reduce agency time. Agency time is the time that program participants spent waiting for services waiting, they spend it waiting to speak to somebody who can listen to their concerns and address them. Uh, we want to do what we can to reduce that time because our clients are very busy people. Uh, they are sometimes trying to take care of 10 things in one day. And if you go from place to place and you have to spend time waiting everywhere, 
and you're obviously going to lose time throughout the day that you're not going to be able to effectively use. So for all clients that come into our office, at, at least, uh, we want to tend to their, to their matters as swiftly and as quickly as possible because we realize they, they came from somewhere on their way to us and they are going somewhere after they leave us. And so we want to make sure we, we honor that. Of course, working within the jail system has its own difficulties as an outside provider um, or even across criminal justice agencies. So coordinating for a program participant between the probation officer, the sheriff's department, the parole officer, and the public defender, you could probably imagine it can be very challenging to do that. Um, we find that having um, strong relationships in place most certainly helps with that challenge. So knowing the person that you want to call and having that open line of communication can really go a long way. And then we have, you know, it may not be that much different in other parts of the uh, country. Of course, we have an affordable housing crisis. Uh, homelessness is a huge problem. I think San Diego County has the nation's third largest homeless population and many of our clients experience homelessness on a routine basis. So this is nothing necessarily that we as an agency can um, effectively address, but it is still something that affects our work, of course. Um, I'm almost, um, almost there. And um, system level challenges continue with bridging gaps in treatment capacities. And I really don't know how this works in other counties, but we sometimes face um, difficulties with that where we have clients who are too severe for a residential substance use treatment program because of their mental um, health status, but then they don't have enough hospital or number of hospitalizations to qualify for ACT services because they spend most of their time in jail and not in psychiatric units at hospitals. And so they really fall into this gap of there is no adequate uh, service provision for these people. And so we, you know, it's very challenging to find the right level of care for these individuals. Um, and so we need to establish a system of, of care that addresses all these gaps, um, because most people in my professional experience have very complex needs. Um, you don't typically have clients that only have substance use or that only have mental health issues. Um, they typically have both and the severity may range. Uh, substance use needs may be lower or higher than mental health. Um, and then in addition to that, you have, of course, financial insecurity, you have homelessness, you have health issues. Um, so we find in our, in our clients in the population we work with that um, some of these needs cannot be effectively addressed in the current system. And I have also listed here on the individual level, of course, you know, securing financial resources, um, processing SSI or SSDI applications, of course, may take its time. How do you sustain a client during that time? What, what can you do as an agency to ensure the person has access to food? They have access to a safe place. Um, they can buy their toiletries. You know, all of these things are, of course, um, important to consider. And some of the available solutions that we have been able to implement, um, as you can see here, we find the in-reach component is extremely valuable because it allows us to build a relationship. It builds rapport with the person before they get released. Once a person gets released, they may have all kinds of items on their agenda that they never told you about. And if you don't have um, a good relationship with them at that point, they may not continue to talk to you uh, simply because they may not see the value that you bring um, as an agency, as an organization, as a service to their life. And so establishing that in reach and, and having that relationship in place before a person gets released, you may know that the first 24 to 48 hours after a person's release can be the most critical period um, for that person in terms of, you know, are they going back to homelessness? Are they going back to using um, perhaps, or are they not taking their mental health medication? Um, so we want to make sure we are there during that critical time and beyond to enhance the chance that the person will be successful in the community. Um, we, of course, have to, we have to assist with transitional housing and financial support and transportation. I don't see how you could meaningfully offer reentry services or in-reach services without also offering 
um, these added um, systems of support, and I know jo um, Jacob's uh, program, for example, with the anti-recidivism coalition, they do something similar. So it's important to have that. Um, on the system level, we want to, for example, follow housing first principles. We don't, we expect almost um, that clients will relapse. It is not uncommon to happen at all. Now, if we make that a requirement for them to access housing that they don't relapse, then simply most of our clients will not be house. So we do want to follow housing first principles to lower the barriers to re-entry. We don't want to increase them. You have to have good and solid and strong relationships with your law and for your local law enforcement um, communities and organizations. And of course you want to have interdisciplinary discharge planning teams, your social workers, your clinicians, your substance use counselors, your peers, they all bring valuable perspectives and experience uh, to the table when it comes to providing the best care possible for a client. Warm handoffs, I cannot, I could talk all day about warm handoffs. Making sure the client is received at the, whatever the other provider may be, making sure there is a person there that will welcome them, um, that they can start services. Sometimes a document is lacking or um, I don't know, another phone call needs to be made and, you know, really being there and ensuring the person can access services. It can be so discouraging when you have an agency that tells you you can receive services over there and then you go there and then they tell you, oh, actually your birth certificate is missing or this document may be missing. It can be so disempowering. And so having warm handoff services and ensuring the person can start treatment or can start whatever other support service is extremely um, important for our population, for the people we work with. And um, these are the references to the literature I used today. And with that, I will hand it over to, I believe, Jacob. mute pause here okay there we go hello everyone I, I apologize for that my name is jacob Bavard, and i'm with arc also known as the anti-recidivism coalition and i want to give you a quick um kind of history of arc uh as i go into this presentation uh, arc was founded around 2013 but its roots can be traced back to about 2003, when founder Scott Butnick was first uh, invited to Barry J. Nordoff Juvenile Hall by a colleague. At the time, Scott worked in the film industry as executive vice president of Green Hat Films, where he produced numerous successful comedies. And I'm quite sure that you guys seen some of them, like the Hangover series. Um, a friend from Inside Outriders, uh, offered Scott an opportunity to go in and do a writing class inside Barry J. Nordoff Juvenile Hall. Scott sat alongside incarcerated youth at, in the compound, including some as young as 15 years old, who were facing adult prison sentences. One boy was facing more than 200 years in prison. In their writings, he learned of the terrible decisions they had made, but he also learned of childhoods marked by trauma, violence, and neglect. That day, Scott committed to mentoring incarcerated youth and has since conducted regular writing classes at Barry J. Nordoff Juvenile Hall. Over the years, Scott students were released from juvenile halls and prisons across, across California, and he wits, witnessed many of them return to incarceration, unable to overcome the challenges of reentry due to the lack of community support that led them into the system in the first place. ARC began as an annual camping trip, bringing together a few dozen formerly incarcerated young people with positive mentors to offer encouragement, guidance, and resources. Today, ARC has grown into a support and advocacy network of more than 1,400 members and hundreds of volunteers and allies committed to helping one another through reentry and advocating for a fair criminal justice system. While the, while the organization continues to prioritize peer support, 
ARC is now able to offer comprehensive services, including case management, trauma counseling, housing, education and employment assistance, mentorship, and opportunities for civil engagement. To date, we have over 1,400 active formerly incarcerated members across California and serve over 6,000 men and women still inside prisons and facilities. Over 41,000 people have been impacted by our policy advocacy work. The majority of ARC members live in Los Angeles County where the organization was founded. In September of 2016, ARC opened the second office in Sacramento County where it serves more than 200 people. Over the past three years, ARC, ARC has expanded its network to also include members in San Diego County, Orange County, Riverside County, San Bernardino counties, and as well as the San Francisco Bay Area. So, one of the things that uh, ARC is well known for is their peer support network. And that was started with the Hope and Redemption team. In early 2017, ARC received funding from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation to develop a regional team of formerly incarcerated staff members to lead rehabilitative program, programming and reentry support in seven Southern California prisons. Uh, and just so you guys know, uh, just recently, uh, we were given some money uh, from the governor's office to ex expand this program statewide. So we'll be in all 31 prisons uh, running the Hope and Redemption team uh, come the end of this year. So the Hope and Redemption team is led by eight former lifers. Um, and the program was launched in 2017, as I said before. Uh, and some of the programs we run inside uh, the, the prisons are Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous, Board Prep, and uh, we run a YOP or Youth Mentoring Program uh, uh, kind of class. Uh, all the services, all of ARC services have been co-designed by and for its formerly incarcerated members. 76% of our staff are, are system impacted by, system impact, excuse me, uh, in our formerly incarcerated, many of whom are considered specialists in the field of criminal justice reform and reentry services, including 20% of our board of directors, 60% of our executive leadership team, and 100% uh, of our life coaches. The Hope and Redemption team was uh, the brainchild of our now executive, executive director, Sam Lewis. Uh, upon meeting S uh, Scott in 2014, Sam had brought an idea to Scott about those of us who are formerly incarcerated being closer to the problem and also closest to the solution. He believed that in order to do uh, have impactful in reach, you needed people who have walked the path, who have treasured the path, who have succeeded in overcoming the obstacles that come along with walking through that path. Therefore, the Hope and Redemption team was born. We believe that reentry starts inside. And we also believe that uh, the most impactful uh, reentry uh, is led by individuals with former uh, sentences, not necessarily life sentences, but people who have been, who have prior experience with the, uh, the, the system. And the reason for that is, uh, it gives people instant credibility when you walk into a prison and say, hey, you know what? I was in that seat. I did. I spent there for 25 years and now I'm out here successful. People tend to listen. People tend to gain hope. People tend to want to do better because they believe that if I can do it, they also can do it. And so the reentry on the inside. Uh, we do that through rehabilitative programming, and a lot of our programming in also focuses on character development. Uh, we truly believe that character development um, is the, the basis for people being successful in their reentry into society, society, because character development helps you make better decisions based on character and not just uh, your environment or the things that goes around. I'm not gonna steal because it's not within my character to steal. Not because I don't need the money, not because I'm 
I'm in a neighborhood where that's not accepted. I'm going to do it because it's against my principles and it's against my, my morals to steal. So I'm not going to do it. We really believe that by building the character up, it allows people to make better decisions, which enhances their life in the future. We also run a lot of policy workshops from the inside. We believe that um, the people that are being affected, who are being adversely affected by the laws, are the, per are the people who are best suited to figure out what laws need to be addressed. Um, we have guys who are doing um, five years for a crime and 60 years in enhancements for prior convictions and guns and gang membership. Um, and so we know that some of these laws are not fair to certain populations as gang members and uh, people who tend to, to carry firearms and live a more violent lifestyle are uh, sentenced much harshly within the California Department of Corrections, whether right or wrong. Uh, that's what's happening. Our mission at ARC is to change the lives and create safe, healthy communities by providing the support and the advocacy network for and by formerly incarcerated men and women. We have a Facebook page with over 1600 members on it. And so we encourage a lot of our members to reach out to the members on our Facebook page for whatever trauma or issue they're going through, because there's a likelihood that out of the 1600 people, someone has already experienced that or is going through it. Uh, and so we believe that peer support uh, is a very powerful tool in keeping people on track uh, once they get back on this side of, of the, the gates. We live by five tenants. We agree to live by five tenants and the five tenants, tenants being uh, one, being crime free. Uh, we want to live a crime free lifestyle. Two, we want to be drug free and we do we understand that addiction it's a disease and so we understand that it's not a, a easy thing to to um to shake but we also understand that with due diligence that we can get past the drug addiction we can get past the addiction to lifestyles and uh we can be crime free and drug free if we are determined to do so uh we also want to be gang free uh because the gang Although um, not all gang members are violent, uh, every gang member is a criminal. And to be involved in criminal activity or be involved in gang activity involves you in criminal activity. Uh, and that's something that we want to stay away from. We also would like for the person to be working or in school. We want people to be productive. We want people to be invested in the value that they have in themselves. Uh, when you have something that's valuable, you invest in it. And so we try to help people figure out what their value is so they can invest in it uh, through education and work. And we also want people to be willing to be of service. Uh, we believe that if you're involved in a community, if you're taking an active role and making the community a better place, uh, it's a lot harder uh, to commit uh, crimes or things that are not in the interest of the best of the uh, community. Uh, that you're living in. And so these tenants are, are something that every member agrees to. We all, you know, challenge ourselves to live by. Sure, there's setbacks. Sometimes we have issues with members, uh, but this is an organization of second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth chances. Uh, there's not just one chance. We, we meet people where they're at and hopefully help them uh, deal with the past traumas and continue to have a healthy or create a healthy lifestyle that's worth living into. So our staff, our staff is 76% formerly incarcerated or system impacted. The, the number of years here, combined years of incarceration is mostly, this is just the hope and redemption team. So you can imagine, uh, with the Hope and Redemption team, there's 263 years combined, and the Hope and Redemption team makes up like 5% of the, of the staffing at ARC. Uh, so altogether, there's over 1,000 years of incarcerated experience at ARC with people who have dealt with the system on both sides, dealt with it from the criminal justice side and from the advocacy side. 
Uh, so a lot of these men here are all former lifers and they run the program. Just wanted to include them because I don't think they get enough credit for the work that they do. <laughs> uh, we're programming in 10 prisons at this time. Uh, you see the prisons up there, Calipatria State Prison, Sitinella State Prison, Corcoran State Prison, Ironwood State Prison, Kern Valley State Prison, uh, CSP Lancaster, North Kern State Prison, Pelican Bay State Prison, Prison, and Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility. We have just uh, gotten a grant, as I have shared with you earlier, to expand the services statewide, and so we will be in all 31 prisons, which is a, a great thing to have a formerly incarcerated person on grounds at each facility to help people build relationships, uh, to help them get back out and be successful in reentry. The character development classes, the character development classes that we run are Criminals and Gang Members Anonymous, which is a 12 step program. Uh, we truly believe that most people or a lot of people, when I say a lot of people, I'm talking gang members are addicted to lifestyles and that drugs, violence, and many of the things that we focus on as issues are really symptoms to the problem. Uh, when someone's addicted to drugs or someone is committing gang, uh, crimes uh it is believed by myself that this is a cry for help uh this is someone that wants to change but doesn't know how and so he resorts to what he knows which is criminal activity criminals and gang members anonymous gives us an opportunity to give them uh, a basis to work from to to separate themselves from that lifestyle and reach into their their character and change what they accept as acceptable we also do board prep. We're one of the few we're one of the few organizations that do uh, border parole hearings preparations uh, because we've all experienced border parole hearing preparations. We've all lived through them. We all went through them. We know how to prepare. We know what they're looking for, and so we go in there and we help a lot of these guys figure it out. We don't tell them what to do or how to do it or uh, what should be or, or, or what how to answer a question. What we do do is we show them what the board is looking for. We teach them critical thinking skills so they can look past the obvious answer. We also help them put together portfolios. We help them do relapse prevention. We help them do uh, remorse letters. Uh, we help them start getting back with their inner selves so they can present themselves to the board in a way that shows that they're responsible and ready to re-enter society and be productive taxpaying citizens. We also run a youth offender program because uh, part of the five tenets is that uh, you'd be willing to be of service in your community. Well, the person that's incarcerated, the community that he has is inside the prison. And so we, uh, we want to start people to uh, participate in community activities inside. And we do that through our mentoring program. We have uh, older gentlemen who have spent considerable considerable amount of time in prison mentoring youth offenders that's coming in at 17, 18, 19 years old, helping these guys figure it out, figure out how to stay out of trouble, how to get into college, how to uh, get into vocational trades so they can learn a skill to help them uh, find employment once they're released from prison. Uh, our program, uh, we've, we've provided program for over 10,000 people in this is a graduation of heart at the Pelican Bay uh, State Prison. Uh, even guys in Pelican Bay, the hardest of the heart, so-called criminals are doing whatever they can to invest in being better people. I believe that um, the system, ha it has changed so much and it has allowed people to regain a voice. And hope is a very powerful thing. And now that people have hope and they have a voice, they're working hard to become better people and take their role as leaders in their community and helping stop some of the gang violence and some of the, the drug problems we have within our communities. We also program in the segregated housing units. Um, it was once told to me that the people in the segregated housing units were California's worst criminals, the people that were not worth rehabilitation they were throwaways. We found by working while working in the segregated housing unit that these men are, they're some of the most compassionate and caring people alive. They just experienced a lot of trauma as a young, as young people. They've been through a lot 
and don't know how to process the trauma that they were going through. And so uh, ARC provides them with an avenue to come to group and practice group therapy and processing the traumas of their childhood. Since the pandemic started, we have uh, 210 participants and 129 graduates of a program. And that's only in the last year or so. Um, the shoe is really dwindling. A lot of people are getting out, uh, but it is important that we do not forget about the people in the segregated housing units. I believe a lot of programs go in and they focus on the people that's in general population. They focus on the people who are, um, who are, who are programming. But I believe that is our responsibility to also look towards the people who are having, who are challenged by programming, who are challenged by doing the right stuff, who are challenged uh, to realize that they have value, not only to themselves, but to the community. Um, and so we do that by uh, running programming inside the segregated housing units, whether at Pelican Bay or Tehachapi or Portland. Uh, we are extremely big on family reunification. We believe that uh, family reunification, reunification is one of the, the three major things in reentry uh, that derails people most of the time. Um, and we do, we have multiple groups uh, in, to help people get through whatever uh, ailments they may have once they get out here with their family. So we run a healthy relationships group. And this group is about really establishing a health, healthy relationship, not just with your, your, other, your significant other, but also with your children, uh, with your parents, with your siblings, understanding that you're a different person and they're a different person. And the way that we relate to each other in this relationship is gonna be different. Understanding that there has to be some healthy boundaries set. Um, a toxic relationship is a toxic relationship. It doesn't matter if it's with your, your parents or with your mate or with your children. If it's a toxic relationship, we have to put we have to put a, um, a boundaries in to make it either healthier or we need to remove ourselves from it. And a lot of the programs that we have help people uh, do just that because one of the most difficult things to do for a person that's in, previously incarcerated incarcerated is to eliminate people from them from their lives after they've been isolated for so long and so we have uh, multiple voluntary supports to the support family unification uh it strengthens family ties and promote rehabilitation uh, like i said we have uh, healthy relationships groups we have seeking sa safety groups we have celebrating families which i i really really enjoy because it works with the family and the, and the individual separately um, and then it brings them together uh, at the end to kind of uh, reignite the relationship. And we have plenty of group therapy, even with therapists. Uh, the HEART program, like I said, all of our coaches are 100% are formally incarcerated. Uh, we all come from a place of understanding. We all been there. There's no judgment. And we help walk people through a lot of the obstacles that we know are there that they can't see. Uh, one of the one of the advantages of being previously incarcerated is that uh, you can see blind spots that people who have not treasured the path can they can't see it, uh, but we can because we've experienced it. And so having that personal knowledge allows us to to help people uh, once they get into these uh, these challenge zones, as I call them, because everyone gets out five or six months they're doing well, and then things start going well. I mean, start going wrong. And for those of us that have walked that path before, we can walk them through that troubled time. Uh, and so we also believe in the continuity of services. And so we also provide a ride home program, much like which was described in the previous, previous presentation. And our ride home program began in 2013 as a partnership between ARC and the Three Strikes Project at Stanford Law School. Uh, it, it empowers uh, it empowers people, uh, you know, to to be confident about coming home. Uh, all of our drivers are formerly incarcerated people, and what we like to do is we really like to during the ride kind of like help people or walk people through the first three days of their car of their of their freedom uh kind of talking about the pitfalls 
the good times, some of the things they'll be facing, some of the anxieties, some of the challenges. Uh, we're there to answer any questions. We're also there to provide resources and to help them find uh, housing programs to talk about uh, getting the birth certificate, uh, all I-9 documents, I uh, IDs, uh, social security cards. Uh, we want to be the first person that a person sees walking out the gate so we can start giving them the support that they need immediately. Um, because someone getting out of prison, except, especially after doing an extended period of time, needs a lot of support. Some of the things we do on the, the ride, besides the counseling, is we purchase uh, we purchase clothing for the participants, making sure that they can get out of the prison garb and that they can get into civilized clothing. We give them their first meal, take them to a restaurant, and get them, let them choose whatever meal they want. Uh, you know, me in particular, I like steak and eggs, so I always uh, uh, encourage that, but that, that's not always what's chosen. Um, and then we connect them to social networks on the way home. We're connecting them to other organizations, community based organizations that may have services that are helpful for them. Um, we have to realize that it takes a village to raise, uh, to raise a, a person that's coming out of incarceration, not just a child. And so we have to work together and collaborate with one another. So all of our services can uh, provide wrap all of our services together can can provide a totality of services to help this per person gets back into society. Oof. The inReach programs, uh, so the inReach programs, they benefit, they have a support network, they have a we have a comprehensive reentry services, which I say, we start inside with the, with the groups, we do the wraparound services, we do the ride home program, we bring people back. Once we get people back down here, we provide them with uh, a plethora of, uh, of opportunities uh and so i'll i'll talk about some of these opportunities right so support services so arc serves as a positive encouraging community so that members feel empowered and capable as they transition back into the community below are some of the specific ways we support members during the reintegration process counseling services arc licensed therapists and therapy interns provide one-on-one -on -one counseling services as well as group programming for members ARC Life Coaches connect members to a range of services and resources, including legal support, identification, public benefits, transportation needs. We also have mentor, uh, mentorship. Uh, ARC's mentorship program is designed to help members develop a strong sense of self and a, per and a purpose in the community. New members are paired with peer mentors to, at intake and ultimately become mentors themselves. ARC also provides mentorship opportunities for members with volunteers known as allies and their professional fields of interest. And so we want people to be uh, kind of like fathered into different professions. And uh, so we, we like to pair people up so people can show them the many tracks of life out here. Um, we also provide housing. Uh, we believe that my housing is a staple to reentry without housing. Uh, there's a very good likelihood that a person will return back to custody. And so we really focus on helping people find housing. Uh, men and women returning home from incarceration face barriers to safe, affordable housing, which can further prevent them from maintaining steady employment and accessing, and accessing the critical services needed for successful reentry. Launched in September of 2004, I believe, uh, the ARC Transitional Housing Program uh, is still, uh, was launched in Silmar, California. We have now moved that house to Boyle Heights in, in Los Angeles. Uh, and that, that house had a capacity to serve up to 34 residents. Uh, in February 2017, we opened our second housing program in Koreatown, that Magnolia Transitional Housing Program, with the capacity to serve an additional 21 residents. These two supportive housing programs provide on-site life skills, programming, trauma counseling, education and employment guidance, and live and living mentors to promote independent living and overall wellness among our 55 residents. We also provide career and educational development. ARC guides members in enrolling in education and or securing fulfilling employment to build experience, accountability, and self-sufficiency. Uh, 
case managers support members in identifying ed educational and vocational opportunities and guide members through the enrollment, transfer, and financial aid processes. ARC also offers soft skills and job training workshops that help members build self-confidence, preparing them for placement and part of full-time jobs. We run a second chance union training program. Um, and this is a very good program. It helps people get into the union. Uh, developed in 2016 as a collaborative, collaborative effort, ARC administers the Second Chance Union Training Program in partnership with the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, the Miguel Contreras Foundation in Los Angeles and Orange County's Building and Construction Trade Councils in Southwest College. The initiative is a first of its kind high quality trained program for the formerly incarcerated workers that incorporate both technical education, soft skills development, and supportive services. Following two weeks of soft skills workshop, participants enrolled in a pre-apprenticeship training course offered by Southwest College using the multi-craft core curriculum developed by the, NAF, the North American Building Trades Union designed to meet union standards. The 12-week program places participants directly into paid union apprenticeships in the building and construction trades following graduation. Since the program launched in August of 2016, ARC has enrolled 128 program participants in the Second Chance program across four cohorts. In total, 94 individuals have graduated the program and 71 graduates have been placed in their apprenticeships in the following nine unions which is the electrician, Electricians Union, the Laborers Union, the Carpenters Union, Sheet Metal Workers Union, the Iron Workers Union, Pipe Feeders and Plumbers Union, Operating Engineers Union, Cement Masons Union, and the Painters Union. We also run our, our participants through the career, the career Readiness Program. ARC's Career Readiness Program, launched in October of 2015, provides members with professional development workshops and connects them to employment opportunities. Members who participate in this program receive 20 hours of training across four days, learning skills for obtaining a job and succeeding in the workplace. ARC provides soft skills training, resume writing workshops, and mock interviews and help members to identify personal strengths, interests, and long-term goals. Upon completion of the program, members are connected to job opportunities with employer, employer partners. ARC has partnered with the Los Angeles area Chamber of Commerce, which has strengthened the program by, by providing a wealth of connections to local employers in additional job op, uh, opportunities. Uh, one of the other things that ARC, I believe, does pretty well is policy and advocacy. Uh, we give people their voice back. We want people to understand that you are a part of the community and your voice matters. Um, uh, policy and advocacy, our Sacramento office serves 300 plus members with our team of MS, MSW student interns and youth interns and 11 full-time staff providing holistic re-entry services, which also includes mental health services. The Sacramento team liaisons directly with local employees and educational institutions to improve access to employment opportunities and post-secondary degree and certificate programs for our formerly incarcerated members. We also conduct inside programming with two juvenile halls in Sacramento and Yolo County, as well as programs at the Sacramento Main Jail, two Division of Juvenile Justice Facilities, OH Clothes, and N.A. Chadron, and an outreach program to women at CCWF. Additionally, with the office located near downtown Sacramento, just a, over a mile from the California Capitol building, Sacramento, Sacramento members have plenty of opportunities to advocate for a more fair and justice criminal justice system at both the county and state levels. Sacramento office, in addition to providing direct service, we advance policies that reduce contact with the justice system and improve reentry outcomes for individuals returning home from incarceration. Since 2013, through the passage of 26 new pieces of legislation, our advocacy efforts have led to numerous reforms to California's justice system that have impacted more than 56,000 individuals, including bills that focus on extreme sentencing and the treatment of young people in the justice system. So in a nutshell, ARC um, 
empowers and mobilizes uh, system impacted young people and their families to play a fundamental role in justice reform efforts through leadership development programming, community organizing, and direct policy advocacy. ARC also utilizes storytelling to shift public perception of formerly incarcerated individuals and to promote the importance of investing in this population. ARC offers regular advocacy trainings which set, up, which set out to one, inform our members of the current juvenile justice and reentry policy landscape, and two, provide members with tools to share their experience to advocate for fair and more humane criminal justice policies. Advocacy trainings focus on public speaking, per pervasive writing, and storytelling. All of ARC's advocacy trainings are trauma-informed to ensure that members are prepared and supported in sharing their personal testimony. Following these trainings, ARC works with several local and statewide advocacy organizations to create opportunities for members to lend their voice voices to justice reform efforts. This work has led to several, several important improvements in California's justice system. Some of the bills that we have uh, co-authored or co-sponsored, uh, the ones that I really like to highlight are the youth offender ones. Uh, 260, Senate Bill 260, 261, and 1308, which uh, allows someone who was sentenced as a juvenile to be brought back to the board uh, after 25 years uh, to be considered for parole, uh, no matter if they have 200, 300, 400 years. Uh, the science proved that a young man's brain does not mature until he's 26, and a lot of that legislation is built on that, and that a person shouldn't be held accountable for something they did when they were 15 for their whole entire life. Uh, we all make mistakes at 15. So uh, with that, I wanna, I'm gonna end this pre presentation and thank you guys. I wanna uh, ask for your, your guys' forgiveness for my little stutter and I got a little nervous, you got a little sweaty, got a little wet, but um, uh, I, it is a pleasure to be here. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Stephanie Lau uh, to do uh, Catholic Charities uh, Care Corp coordination. Thank you so much, Jacob. <clears throat> uh, it's it, your hard act to follow as is Andrea. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that you'll see in my presentation is a lot of the same themes that both Andrea and Jacob kind of touched upon. Um, but specifically, the work that we do here at Catholic Charities Care Coordination Services in Albany, New York, is related to harm reduction and wraparound services for incarcerated individuals with S. SUD, Substance Use Disorder. Um, just a little bit about who we are. So Catholic Charities Project Safe Point is a public health program providing harm reduction services for people who use drugs. We're grant funded and uh, as part of this grant fund, we uh, provide a number of low special services such as HIV, hepatitis C, and overdose prevention services. Um, services are all designed to range from these low threshold to more, uh, comprehensive, such as the case management that I'll talk about today. Our goal in general through our harm reduction um, array of services is to reach vulnerable disengaged populations, to link people who use drugs with services that will decrease the ne negative impact of their substance use and increase their safety, and to respond to disproportionate rates of disease and death in people who use drugs. Our lines of service. So here in New York State, we have what's called the Drug User Health Hub. Um, this is, these are a number of hubs throughout the state that are directly funded by New York State to provide harm reduction services. And as I mentioned, that includes syringe exchange, um, overdose prevention, outreach and engagement services, low buprenorphine uh, clinics. So, so for example, what that means is we have the capacity to provide um, access to buprenorphine via a nurse practitioner who we subcontract with, and she prescribes that. That doesn't include any kind of um, formal like counseling or anything. It really is just about accessing the buprenorphine treatment and then working with that individual to identify what other things are going to help them kind of keep on this path of recovery. Um, and then we have uh, a really, there's a really big push in New York to do he hepatitis C treatment, particularly among people who use drugs. Um, so connecting with individuals who have hepatitis C and then walking them through that treatment um, to cure. Uh, we have peer navigation services. So these are peers, people with lived experience who are working
working directly with our clients, again, along that continuum of care. Um, harm reduction and wraparound services, which we'll talk about today. And then we also have the law enforcement assisted diversion uh, program. So this is a program, a case management program that directly works with law enforcement um, who are, you know, to case manage individuals. So law enforcement will have an interaction with an individual, and if they meet the eligibility criteria, the law, uh, the, the officer can use their discretion and uh, divert that person into case management rather than um, arresting them. And the idea behind that is to kind of break that cycle um, of people ending in and, you know, people going in and out of jail. Um, so where does inReach fit in to our harm reduction or entry rep services? Well, I, you know, I think the first thing to say is, you know, when we talk about these services, we always uh, emphasize that we are a community-based program. However, I think as was, you know, clearly discussed in um, both the presentations prior to mine, there is so much value in that inReach, right? So, you know, we have a collaboration with Albany County Corrections and Rehabilitative Services, which is our county jail, um, to provide these services. The initial aim is to reduce fatal and non-fatal overdose among people who are um, released, to lower their rates of recidivism, and to address any needs that may impede a safe and successful return to the community. Um, and so originally, you know, this program really was around uh, supporting that work that was happening in the jail, but also recognizing that in order for individuals to be successful post discharge, they need a lot of support, right? And, and so, you know, although in the, the beginning of this sort of trajectory of this connection, their, be, their work is directly, that work is really happening in the jail. They're being screened at the jail uh, for their eligibility in terms of medication-assisted treatment. Um, and then once that screening has happened and the person has been deemed eligible, they're being passed along or referred to us for us to begin that in-reach or that engagement process. This is, you know, our wraparound services are not exclusive to only people who are linked with the MAT program. It really is anybody who has any substance that's, use that's needs that's and that's harm reduction that's service. That's a great job, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. Um, so, in-reach and engagement. Um, so, you know, really quickly, it's one of the things that we learned um, as a community-based provider is in order to engage, um, you know, a, a correctional facility, it's really important to get an understanding about what happens in the jail and how it happens, and and if, and to be and for this to be a collaborative effort. And so we were really lucky in the sense that as the jail started to look at implementing this MAT program, that they invited us to the table to have discussions and decided that they wanted to partner with us. Um, and so in doing that, we really identified ways that we could make it very easy for that connectivity to, to happen. Um, so once they've identified that somebody could use our services, you know, rather than this sort of long, like, you know, intake process or referral process, it really is just a quick email that goes to the group of people who are working with that individual. And that sort of starts the clock for us. We receive that email, we schedule a visit that very same day or the next, we complete a needs assessment, um, we start talking about what does that discharge plan look like? What are those needs that that person's going to have at, you know, when, when they are released? Um, you know, we immediately start talking about harm reduction strategies. We talk about overdose prevention. We talk about, um, you know, risk reduction in general. We, we try to emphasize that regardless of what that person um, has committed to in, in the jail. So, you know, for many of the people we work with, they are engaged in this MAT treatment, right? So they're getting buprenorphine. They're, maybe they're working with a case sack. Uh, maybe they're, they've talked about identifying, connecting with an inpatient upon release. Um, we stress to them that we recognize that sometimes, you know, people's plans change and their desire to maybe continue on this original trajectory changes, and that that's perfectly fine, you know, that we, we can change with them. We can shift what our focus is. Um, and really, that is because our, mo our most 
what the thing we're most interested in is that people are safe and that they are linked with the appropriate services. So if upon discharge, treatment isn't what that person is interested in, that's fine. Tell me what you are and we'll start working on that. Um, you know, I think as, as both um, Jacob and Andrea talked about, you know, that real, the importance of kind of that planning prior to discharge, because we know it takes a lot of time and, and effort, um, because other entities have their own processes, and so trying to be able to kind of work through that so that at the point that the person is released, there is kind of that warm handoff that's available or the possibility to, to kind of transition smoothly into that. Once the individual has been released, um, you know, or we're looking at that, we really look at that importance of reconnecting with that person. So meeting them at the gate. Just, you know, I think, again, that's something that both Jacob and Andrew really talked about is the value of connecting with that person pretty immediately to address those most immediate needs, right? Transportation, housing, a, a, a safety kind of review. Um, you know, for those involved with the MAT program, it's talking about, you know, can you access that 30-day script? You know, we're lucky, again, that the jail, um, upon release, gives the individual a 30-day script and they pay for it. Um, but in many instances, you know, people don't have an ID. They need an ID to pick up their script. And so we may be offering that support to them to get them to the pharmacy to connect them um, with the resources to be able to pick up that, that prescription. And then also pretty quickly identifying what other support for other services exist. Um, and again, once that, that really, that emphasis on safety planning and, and our harm reduction services, that through our entity, we have the capacity to kind of do, because there's a lot of synergy between our programs. Um, so some program achievements. Since January of 2019, uh, when the program kicked off, we received a total of 500 referrals, of which 300 have engaged with program staff. The ability to inreach and outreach has been a crucial part of our service delivery. It offers the opportunity to engage with individuals, to assess their needs, to do some of that front work, not just around the resources or the services that they need coordinated, but around developing a rapport with, person, with a person and an opportunity to give them um, a chance to get to know you and trust you, trust you enough to tell you, you know, what is it that they really need? What are their intentions when they leave? All participants receive overdose prevention training and naloxone at discharge. This is one of the things that as a program, we were really, really working to ensure that happened. And this is for all, not just the individuals that we meet with, but this is for all individuals who are at the jail. Knowing that those people leaving a facility at such high risk for overdose, we thought it was really important that access to overdose prevention and access to naloxone needed to be part of the work that we were doing in the jail. Um, I think we recognize that each engagement offers the opportunity to reinforce harm reduction strategies and safety planning. You know, I think at the core of everything that we do in, in the facility, it's really about prioritizing harm reduction strategies and safety planning and the opportunity to be able to work with individuals on helping them self-identify ways that they can make those behavior changes. And I think the other piece of that is to be able to model for the facility about the value of harm reduction, about the value of individuals, you know, engaging with services that really meet them where they're at and really ask them to work with you to identify what is the most appropriate next step for them. Uh, you know, I think as we heard in the previous, um, you know, in the previous uh, presentations and, you know, for anybody who works with individuals, success varies from person to person. Um, but success is, is possible for everybody. You know, I think one of the things, we don't measure it by, oh, this person was MIT, uh, was on MAT, and now they're, you know, they've continued on, that they're a success versus somebody who decided that they were gonna go back to using. Um, you know, I think what we look at are the individual behaviors that each of those individuals might change, which does. They walked out with a Narcan kit, that's wonderful. They, they walked out with our phone number and called us and say, hey, you know what, I decided I don't want to go to the treatment provider, I need some syringes and said, that's success. You know, so I think, you know, the acknowledgement and the recognition that success looks different depending on where that person is at and our capacity to be able to support them along that continuum is also really important. Um, and then I think I sort of mentioned this before, but I, I certainly want to be able to emphasize it again about the opportunities to educate, advocate, and reinforce harm reduction 
and address stigma with the correctional setting has been invaluable. The opportunity to be a collaborative partner, to be able to, you know, in many instances, our approaches can sometimes be conflictual. Um, but we have found a way to learn from each other and to work together, ultimately knowing that in the end, this collaborative effort really serves the population that we're trying to help. It saves lives um, and it helps change lives, something that I think both the facility and us are very proud of. Great. I think that's it. Erica, back to you. Thank you, Stephanie, and I wanted to take just a moment to thank all of today's pre presenters uh, for sharing a wealth of information and your perspectives on this topic. Uh, unfortunately, we are at the end of the time for today's event, so we, we will not have time to address the, the questions that we receive from the audience. We at the GAIN Center will work on seeing if we, we might have another way to get that information to the people in the audience today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, documents that we'd like to share for anybody who would like to download them. We mentioned that there is a, an attendance certificate, um, again, not for CEU credits, it's for personal portfolio use only. Um, and in addition, we have um, a, a publication that may be of interest um, to, to some of you out there on um, guidelines for uh, supporting the transition for people uh, who have behavioral health disorders who are re-entering after uh, uh, incarceration. So if you'd like to download those, you should see a, a file transfer box right now that has come up on your screen. Go ahead and select the name of the documents you'd like. You can select both and hit the download button. And that should start the process for saving those to your computer. I'd like to also mention there are a couple of, uh, we've got quite a few questions um, from the audience that were specific to uh, one or more of the programs that were covered today. And I'd like to encourage everyone in the audience to um, please go ahead and look up these three organizations online. Uh, they all have uh, websites where there's a, a contact us information. And so you can, you can follow the activities of these organizations online. Uh, if you, if you'd like further information, I'd like to share just some information about 2 upcoming webinars that are hosted by the gain center. Uh, on September 1st, we have an event on certified community behavioral health clinics, and that's going to be a discussion group format. And on September 2nd, we have a webinar that is focused on. Uh, using culturally relevant approaches to support Native American people who have justice involvement. So we hope you can join us for those. If you're not already subscribed to the GAINS listserv, this is where you can receive information on all of our upcoming events as well as trainings and other opportunities. So I'd like to encourage everyone to sign up to receive those, those notifications from us if you are not already signed up. And finally, uh, our contact information. If you have follow up comments or questions for us, please feel free to reach out to the Gain Center at the information provided here on this slide. And finally, th there should be a final poll coming up. Uh, this is where you can enter uh, requests or comments about additional TA that you're interested in, in receiving or hearing about, and we do share those results with SAMHSA. So if you'd like to put in, um, any of your feedback there, we always like to hear from you. So, once again, thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to everyone in the audience, and we look forward to seeing you all at the next event. And I hope you all have a great day.